All right, hello everyone. We are going to get here start. We're going to give everyone a couple minutes before we get started um, so that everyone's here. Um, and we'll get started shortly. I can hear some children and dogs. Yep. <laughs> can everybody who's joining hear us already at this point? Yes, they can. Good. Hi, everyone. We're glad. Hello, you're everyone. Here. Yeah, it looks like we've got about half the people that registered in here. Uh, real quick. Great. This will be fun. This is such a new world for all of us. So, it is. Stephen and I are happy you're here and uh -huh. our happy friends. Everyone, hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Just so you know, there's a chat function. I just put a message out there. If you have any questions during the seminar today, please feel free to submit them so we can best address them in this next 60 minutes before we get started. So thank you. I love the chat feature. I see Biliana. Hi, Biliana. Okay. You know, there's lots of friends out there. Absolutely. Yeah. This is great. This has been an adventure. And we know all of us have lots of thoughts and lots of questions to share. Yes. Yeah, so we'll Donna says she can hear and see, but can't see or hear herself. And I think that's the design of the panel today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we've got more than half the people that RSVP'd here. So I think we'll go ahead and start. Sure. Um, my name is Casey Saliba. And I am the Vice President Steinway Hall. And I just wanted to start the meeting by saying hello to everyone. We, we haven't seen a lot of you in a long time. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us for our second teacher webinar. Uh, we got some really good feedback from the first one and we look forward to continuing to do these uh, going forward. Um, all of our showrooms, just as a quick update, are we are doing private shopping only right now. Um, we're getting closer to opening up to normal um, once we have all the supplies and cleaning and everything that we're doing. Um, and piano sales surprisingly have been very good during these, during these times. Um, people are running out of things to do at home and a lot of them are either adding a piano or up, upgrading their piano. So we appreciate all the referrals that you all send in. Uh, so other than that, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan and Gordon and we have a wonderful seminar and I really appreciate uh, you all being here to partake in this today. So thank you and enjoy. Over to you, Gordon. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, if we haven't yet officially met, um, I am Gordon McNelly. I uh, work at the Steinway Hall location with my colleague, uh, Jonathan, uh, who is on here as well. And uh, I know just based on all the names, it looks like we've got about 59 people uh, on this right now. A lot of the names that I'm seeing are super familiar, but unfortunately we probably just haven't had the chance to, to meet in person yet. So consider this my face <laughs> and Jonathan. So whenever you stop in, uh, please feel free. Um, I wanted to start off by um, saying how grateful we are um, to everyone, to first of all, our, 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 our panelists, Stephen and, and, and Kathy, um, but also to everyone on here for taking the time to uh, not only express your interest, but to join us. You know, I'm also very humbled by, by your generosity of your time. And we, we, we very much thank you for that because other than this, you could probably be teaching. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you for your time. You know, and I also wanted to, if I may have a little bit of discretion to invoke a little scripture here. Um, you know, uh, wise King Solomon said in Proverbs that by iron, iron itself is sharpened. So one man sharpens the face of another. 
and, and this platform that we have to sharpen each other's skills and to take the time to share this knowledge um, is one that we hope will continue. And we hope that, that the, the information that we're presenting today is and something that you, you can Gordon, you're breaking uh, up. Well, uh, if you hovering at the bottom, you'll see a little icon that says chat. So uh, we look forward to this. And at this point, I'm gonna start the presentation by introducing our panelists, uh, Catherine Leisinger and, and, and uh, Stephen Nielsen. Catherine, uh, DMA, Applied Piano Faculty and Head of Piano Pedagogy at SMU. Uh, she's also a gold medalist of both the Weidman International Competition and MTNA Sangley Young Artist Competition and is also TMTA Pre-Collegiate Teacher of the Year. Uh, Stephen is a Steinway artist, uh, part of that elite, elite roster, and he's also the 2019 inductee to the first Steinway Hall, or Steinway Teacher Hall of Fame, where he was recognized in New York. Uh, Stephen was part of the Nielsen and Young piano duo for over 40 years, and has been a university and private teacher for over four decades. So starting off, Welcome, Kathy and Stephen. Um, and I guess one of the basic questions that, that we can ask um, that uh, everyone might have an interest in is if you could share with us um, in this new world that we're all you know, participating in, um, can you share with us some insight into some of the platforms that you have either experimented with or that you're currently using and uh, some of the, the, the benefits and, and possible challenges that you've seen in either of those platforms, if you, if you would be so kind. Sure, thank you so much for having both of us. This is such a great opportunity to see our friends and to share what we've been learning together. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone, and we've talked about this a lot together as a group, that this is a real seismic shift for us. Everything we do is about sound, and now that sound is completely unfamiliar. And so um, the answer to your question, I have mostly used Zoom in part because that's what our, our university had advised us to use on all our platforms. So I started with it and I've also tried FaceTime and Skype a little bit. And I found Zoom to be most um, compatible for a variety of reasons. Hey, same, Kathy. Same question? Yes, yes. I have found uh, Zoom, uh, again, uh, the agreeable one, but let me just first preface preface this to say, I think my role here is as an encourager, because I am probably the epitome of the reluctant techie. Uh, and so if I can be an encourager to many of you for whom, again, this is a brave new world, I would be happy to. I uh, have found Zoom to be quite adequate for the moment. I may ascend in my uh, techno wizardry at some point, but it's worked really well, uh, not only for private lessons, but uh, my, uh, this is a shout out to my daughter, Caroline, who's a doctoral student at NEC in Boston, who manages my biweekly master classes from her apartment in Boston. And what that has done is revolutionized the continuity for my teaching in this, in this new normal, uh, so that I've been able to maintain uh, uh, private lessons plus the group experience. And that, that has, for me, been revolutionary. Have you, well, thank you, that's, that's, that's very insightful. Have you, um, have you experienced any challenges uh, with any of your students or their families in certain platforms that they use? For example, this may not apply to you, but I know if, if some teachers are using FaceTime, obviously that's an Apple-based uh, platform. But what if the, the student that they're using doesn't have an Apple-based, you know, maybe they have a, a uh, a Samsung or, or some other type of device. Um, have you run into that challenge at all or have, have all of your students pretty much adopted the same platform with great ease, you know, that, that you're using in this case Zoom? My students have, have uh, basically it's been, worked well, though the quality of that varies from household to household, as you might imagine. Um, 
But of course, as Kathy intimated, and we will get into this in a few minutes, the, the, the audio is, is the, the main challenge uh, for us to be dealing realistically with, as she said, uh, a world of, of sound. Uh, so it, that to me has uh, been basically wonderful. We can get in also later to how families have adapted to this. But uh, I, I have worked with what I've got right now. And I think the beauty of it is that we're continuing training for these wonderful students. Right. I think that a lot of my families and the families in our prep department have found success with Zoom across um, very right. devices. And so that seems to have done the trick for the time being. Um, I yeah. think the challenges actually are more in the realm of um, somebody I noticed already posted, um, Kathy Carroll asks about, if she has a hard time having her parents understand the optimum position. That's an issue. Having too many devices on uh, Wi-Fi at the same time in the house actually can yeah. minimize your success of transmission. Um, and so training the families who have been very compliant and interested in um, continuing the lesson successfully, um, helping us know how to help them optimize the experience is a challenge. Well, yeah. I think, and this, it, go ahead. In this new normal also, I've been amazed at the adaptability of the families, uh, but we've learned <laughs> where, the, where the students go and uh, what all the kind of physical Please, attributes sure. <laughs> of uh, phys physical attributes of where they practice, and that's a whole nother yeah. topic for talking about how to make the lessons more effective. Yeah, and and if I may, I don't know if if, if I, I I experience a little bit of audience. If perhaps you hear uh, something that's being said and there's an interruption, please feel free to ask the question in the chat and we'll get to it to it right away. Um, well, this is really great. And you know, Catherine, you were talking about something that, um, that piqued my interest and we had discussed this previously. You know, you talked about the internet connections, which I just talked about and how that can, um, uh, you know, pose a problem in your limited time that you've got with your lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you were talking about some creative things that, that you've been able to implement. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, to overcome that challenge, which which relies on the student doing a little bit of legwork prior to the prior to the lesson. Can you can you share that with us? I'm happy to share that. Um, all of us will probably or most of us consider ourselves relatively low tech. And my experience with using technology was tended to be limited to my use of my iPad Pro in my own concertizing, but I hadn't used it as much in the context of teaching and I've never taught online. We've always come to um, live lessons. So in terms of the internet um, and the Wi-Fi capabilities, I noticed Leonard Hayes from our um, Booker T um, Arts Magnet School here in Dallas has reminded us that many of the districts have passed out um, hotspots to the children, that's helpful. Um, my experience also included that some of the children had good Wi-Fi in the house, but the range of the Wi-Fi to the piano room was a different issue. And so that involved figuring out that you can actually purchase for relatively uh, inexpensive fee um, Wi-Fi extenders. This can really help beef up what happens um, and how the Wi-Fi accesses the actual piano room. And some people have adjusted where their router is. So um, that fundamental has become really important. Um, do you want me to talk a little bit about my iPad and sh screen sharing? Yeah, I think that would be great. You know, as we lead yeah. into the, the segment that, that you were able to share about what um, your pre-recorded lessons. So what I found most helpful to me, um, and I'll give you a little bit of background in that I teach all ages and all ranges. So I actually have beginners. I have intermediate students who are ages five, six, seven, eight and I have all the way up to advanced graduate students. So I teach quite a wide range and <coughs> I've been maintaining teaching those 25, 30 students, maybe close to 30 um, throughout this, this period. And so it has presented a lot of very interesting difficulties because um, as a teacher, my style tends to be um, very interactive, lots of playing for them. Um, it, it just created with the computer screen here and now me not being able to be there with them, just a whole new world of problems. So um, I found that I've learned quite a lot in the last two months. And my favorite um, device was something I'd learned from my, own, my friends too. I hadn't thought of it initially. 
And it was to ask the students, whether they are beginners or intermediates or very advanced, to record their music, their pieces and everything they plan to present in a lesson from scales and technique to whatever repertoire we were doing. And they had to record it and send it to me the night before. They would send it to me via YouTube links or um, short videos will go by direct text. Um, any platform they could that was easy for the parents. And all of them have found ways to do that. And this has been amazing because this has um, challenged them in ways that made everybody put together a, a more thoughtful video. They were much more careful than they would be when they walked into my studio to play. Sure. They, being recorded was something that heightened everybody's expectations of themselves. So that's been a really cool plus. So let me show you um, the ways that I had done that. I have my iPad Pro here and I'm gonna share a photo to you. My favorite devices and tools I've been using actually are this clip, which I'll show you a photograph in a moment, allows me to clip my iPhone to this um, space right here and capture my hands. The tripod, uh, just a short tripod that you can lengthen is across my room if I wish to position my iPhone over there. And I also happen to have a music stand um, that my computer's on right now from which I'm speaking to you. So what I do is on the Zoom platform, one of the reasons I've chosen to stay with Zoom is this capability of screen sharing. Um, there's a screen share button at the bottom, an option that you all would be able to experiment with right now. And a very important component is that in the moment that you, well, let me just show you this as well. My iPad can be connected by a Bluetooth, but at the moment I'm using a cord that connects my iPad to my computer. So I click the screen share and I have to put share computer sound for this to work very well. And this will pop up a screen that my students can see. At the moment, what I'm sharing to you is simply a photograph. This is a photograph of my, uh, here's me at the computer as you see me now. Here's my student, here's my phone, which has been invited to the same lesson meeting. Um, so I have two devices. I'm actually present at the meeting in two ways. And here's the student's score. And together we can just work through in a more detailed way than me saying, okay, can you listen to measure 20 and let's see what's going on there. So there's that. And then I've had students um, submit videos. And when they submit videos, um, I've already listened to them. My student is, learning to listen to them. They haven't always done that until now. And I realize that I'm asking them to do that more and more. And um, they can, I think you should be able to hear a pretty good um, amount of So all that does is gives me an opportunity to hear this student in more real time and to hear more detail of what she's doing. And let, it, I'm, of course, less advanced than Kathy in all that, but those are marvelous uh, new uh, techniques to which I hope to become accustomed in the very new, <laughs> near future. But I, let me just list a few things that I feel are the challenges. But let me also say, I've come to the conclusion recently that every quote unquote challenge has a silver lining. That's an opportunity for growth, opportunity for me for growth, and, and to uh, act as a teacher as I, as I never have. First of all is adapting to the less than ideal audio. But in that regard, I find that I'm listening visually much more, and I'm, I can guess uh, where I can't all, where the audio doesn't supply the nuance that would be the case in the in-person lesson. I look at hands, I look at phrasing, I look at lifting, and I can get a very good guess while not quite in the real time that uh, Kathy unfolds. I can make pretty, draw pretty good conclusions, reliable conclusions about what they're doing. So it's the nuance, it's the, it's the uh, phrasing, it's the color that is, is the challenge, but uh, in, it, it's a good challenge. Another thing I've discovered is uh, through this business, as we all know, is there's less immediacy. Like Kathy, I'm a hands-on uh, teacher here. I'm, I'm talking to them even over their playing sometimes, and there's an immediacy 
to that response. Whereas via uh, remote, you have to stop them. They have to look at the camera uh, often or look at their iPad and then take uh, those words. And, and so there is, there's a time lag. There's less of an immediacy and less accomplishment in a way, but that makes the student, I think, uh, number one, a better listener and a better implementer. And it makes the teacher a better explainer because I have to explain it through another medium. Um, I often uh, now have, uh, whereas my, many of my students didn't have a pencil handy on their music rack, <laughs> Uh, they all have pencils now. I have thousands of pencils here, but they all have them. And together, we are making marks, they in their home, and I on my copies of their music. So that there's really a, a little higher level of accountability for what the assignment is than uh, in perhaps in former times when they were here. And I like that. Um, go ahead. I was going to yeah. comment on how you're um, challenging your student to make the notes, which does keep them engaged. We know that an issue that all the teachers are thinking about is how do I keep these kids engaged in this dynamic like this on this platform? Um, for them to handwrite is really helpful, but I've also found in the mode where I share my screen with their score that I just right. demonstrated to you, they can see me in real time in various colors write and circle and note things on their score and especially the little kids they think that's so cool and so fun right. and i can hand write their lessons and you know there's there's ways if you have access to an ipad like that um it's great they love that right that, that app is for score probably many of you know that i think the act the very act of a student writing something on the score versus former times when i was the one making marks the very act of doing that makes it go deeper into their subconscious and into their memory. And then of course they have these reminders when they practice the piece the next day and the next day. The matter of verbal uh, communication for me is, has been a challenge in that the younger the student is, the less immediately they respond to what I'm saying. So that's, that's, a, that's a good challenge, but it also helps them to be more verbally uh, interactive. And I, I, I think that's great, it's shifting a sense of responsibility to the students, which we didn't have before. We have, we just got a really good question from Leonard Hayes. He asked, And you know what, Jonathan, what, that's actually a question that we are going to discuss a little later on. And I was going to mention that to, to Leonard. Uh -huh. we're, we're actually going to address that question. Sophia has a great question too. Sophia, Gordon, your audio is going in and out a lot. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to hang around. Yeah, can you hear me? Intermittently. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so we are we are doing well on time. Um, perhaps this would be a great time since we have so many questions coming in. Yeah. That Jonathan, maybe you can field one of the pre-recorded questions that we had, but also maybe some questions that we see coming through. Sure. So one question, a couple of the questions we already kind of addressed just based on some of the things that Stephen and Kathy already talked about from the tools that they use, the phone, the, the, the clip for seeing hands and face at the same time. But one question that um, Sophia Gilmson sent in beforehand said, she wrote, my question, anything and everything that would help to improve the sound that comes from students to me. I understand that they have to have a good internet, reasonably tuned piano, a device, et cetera, but what can she do to improve the incoming sound? And I know when Kathy, during on uh, Wednesday, when we were doing our practice run through, you made a note about how there was something that you clicked through so the audio didn't come through as distorted. So if you can talk about that a little bit more, I think that would be kind of part of an answer to Sophia. Sure, yeah, happy to start. I know Stephen will have ideas too. Um, there is an option on the Zoom for um, turning on the original sound. And that's something we won't have time in this session to address, but that is a topic that we can address perhaps later um, at another time. But there's an original sound option. In my personal experience, that honestly doesn't change things a whole lot. Um, to Sophia's question, um, I think most of us are really frustrated that in synchronous lessons, when we are live together like this, I have yet to find a really great option that feels anything like when we're together, when we're truly right. together. And I do think that people who are more high techie than me have some solutions, including 
I know that there are um, high-tech mics that can help. I know that there are apps such as, there's one called Clean Free that you can simultaneously, as long as you have Google Chrome, you can have the app called Clean Free and your audio is going through that. And then your Zoom is on for you and your student in a muted mode. So there are options that I know are more extensive than I have yet explored and understand. But the way I get around it has forced me to find new ways to work on tone and color in particular. Um, what I've learned is that I have to get used to what the range of the student's piano is doing in our time together. It's not as good as these pre-recorded videos and I can respond more detailed answers to these children and adult children, adult students, um, through the video component and then do my best to demonstrate or describe. I have to describe more things. Um, right. But one um, activity I've done that's helped a lot is have a student play just a scale. And we call that five. And we number all the way up five to 10, having them explore a wider range of dynamics up from five to 10. And then we do five down to zero. And the students are right then and there realizing the range of their sounds and possibilities. We can do a similar activity comparing color and what I would call color. And it's related to watching how they use their finger. Do they flatten their finger? Do they curve their finger? Do they use more arm? Do they use less arm? So I have found that I'm forced to be more creative finding ways to make better tone and color. Well, so and what I was, that's what I was referring to a while ago when I called uh, Brave New World for me, visual listening. Mm -hmm. you, you, you are really trying to discern, discern things never before, whereas in the in-person studio, I could hear mm -hmm. often without actually seeing at, a, at this moment or that moment what they were doing. Right. So that is a challenge. And I think, uh, you know, who was it? Uh, Mark Cuban recently who said that this whole pandemic thing, amazingly, is going to produce a whole new entrepreneurial wave that we haven't even expected. And in our world, that may well uh, be a revolution for all of us, particularly when um, in the whole thing of coming out of this, we have a, uh, opinions and convictions across the gamut, whether to stay in shelter or whether to open up the economy. And I think our students, Kathy would agree with me, our students and their families uh, represent a wide range of opinions. And that's why I have concluded to one degree or another, remote is here for us to stay and it will be a part of our lives, whether we're ready for it or not to, to a degree. Don't you agree, Kathy? I do, I do. I'm sure there'll be some hybrid possibilities in the future of this. Right. Kathy, Susie Kaiser uh, just wrote in and asking, what was the app that you were using for sharing the score? Sharing the score is actually, um, first of all, I was using four score on my iPad. Um, another issue that all of us are facing right now is how are we looking at our students' rep? How are we choosing new rep now that it's summertime? How are we doing that? I can use um, imslp.org has a lot of advanced level rep. When it comes to the children, there are many ways now to get digital copies of rep. But um, my go-to since March, March to May was our big learning curve and these kids were getting ready for recitals and auditions. Um, the parents had to use a free cam scanner app on their phones and send me scans of their children's current music. And it kept right. me from having to scramble. It allowed me to download all these little elementary pieces and intermediate level pieces into my iPad. And then the um, option for sharing the iPad is a button on Zoom called Share Screen. What I discovered, this is really funny, but I learned about that first week or two in March, what madness it was not to have everybody's repertoire ready. And I found myself with no wiggle room between the end of one lesson and the beginning of other to go scramble. And I was running madly to every place in my library to get the next student's repertoire since they often brought their own music to me. Right. So I got busy. I don't have it all digitized yet like Kathy but uh, I have a whole huge stack of music for all students in the order in which I meet them every week. So yeah. that, that improved the efficiency a lot. It does lead to an important aspect I think we're all experiencing, which is that this format is far more exhausting. And it's it exhausting for many reasons. It's exhausting because I talk too loudly through the computer. It's exhausting because I'm 
trying harder to maintain the attention of a younger student. It's, it's very differently um, draining. And what I've learned is that for younger ones, um, giving them two shorter lessons that week is okay. We can have two 20 minute sessions. And for um, older students, um, they have to understand that while we typically might have a 60 minute lesson, I've already spent 15 minutes listening to your scores and, and studying your right. performance already. And that um, that is gonna be tied in and that they shouldn't expect a full 60 minutes every time. Of course, that depends on the student, but <laughs> it does um, help me feel like I'm not cheating them and that we can address more specific problems when we're synchronous. Gordon is muted. Gordon, you're muted. Sorry about that. Internet problems. Um, these are fantastic insights, and 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 I, you know, all the questions are phenomenal. Um, I'd like to. Uh, we're about halfway through uh, the hour that's been allotted. So what I'd like to do is, in you know, obviously keep those questions coming. And and one thing I didn't mention earlier, everyone in our audience, um, questions that we're not able to address today due to time. Um, we're going to use those as uh, opportunities to see if we can create our next webinar in this series based on some of the questions that are coming through. So please feel free, don't hold back. And if we don't get to it, please know that it's something that we will, you know, talk about and see if we can address in the future. And before, um, before you go on too fast, just I, I sent in the chat, make sure when everyone's typing in their questions or responses or insights, to make sure it's not just saying all panelists, but all panelists and attendees, so others can see the questions that are being asked. Because our goal is to get to all of them as best we can, and then if we need to, like Gordon said, do the next webinar based on some of those, and or just do a follow-up snapshot of kind of questions we didn't get to. We want to make get sure we can get to those. So there are a lot make sure of it says panelists and John. attendees. Yeah, good, good. There's a lot of great Thanks, John. experience coming Absolutely. What I'd like to do now is ask a question based on um, uh, benefits that, that we may see. We've talked about a lot of the challenges and, and you know, as every day, new challenges are unveiling themselves. Um, but what about benefits? Are there, in this transition, have you recognized any benefits that you as an educator now have um, that you didn't necessarily have before the ability to have uh, this, this insight directly into the environment that your students are practicing in, the instruments that they're practicing on. Um, can you share with us some of the unanticipated opportunities that, that you've experienced and how you've been able to relate those into your, your teaching methods? Well, first of all, I, I would say, I, I, and like Kathy, I've had an amazing uh, uh, epiphany as to uh, where a students practice. It's remarkable. And in some cases, I applaud it. In some cases, I feel like, uh, and I already have mentioned to some families, how they could upgrade their situation, not only with a piano itself, but with lighting and with um, <clears throat> Uh, collateral collateral damage or collateral noise is going on in their houses with siblings uh, with occasional dark barking dog. I have a lot of empathy for a lot of these families, particularly right now. I see the the not only are they coping with a remote lesson, but they're coping with making it through the pandemic, and that has caused me to be uh, have a great deal of empathy. I still have to maintain a sense of discipline and forward movement, but. Um, I, I can see uh, several families having a light at the end of the tunnel toward improving a piano. And I know Kathy and I have talked about the fact that we realized in some cases how amazing it is that some of our students produce what they produce on, in some cases, a mediocre instrument. Kathy? It's true, right. I agree 100%. So I have in fact given my family some advice on how to better their environment for their child. Sometimes it's as simple as please close the door to the kitchen area when it's practice time or you know, something like that, or please keep little brother out of the room. Um, sometimes it's please pull the piano away from the wall and adjust their bench because your child is getting taller and they are not, they're crunched into the, you know, there's so many things I'm learning when I see them in their home setting. Um, my favorite thing that I've learned though is actually the, um, the improvement of all of our critical listening, mine too. Because oh, right. 
because of these videos, I'm, I'm learning that I've really underutilized this tool that we've easily had for years of having them self assess um, their own music that they're sending to me. And um, even a young child can do this to one of the pieces or one of the sections. I have them listen for themselves and make their own notes on, on their music about what do they think they could have done better. That's been something I will definitely keep because um, it's so easy for us to capture even portions of a piece or left hand alone, right hand alone, any stage of development. Um, we're all um, increasing our critical listening uh, through that experience. So I've loved that actually. Right. There's a good question that April no, Barr was not, and it was a lot. Go ahead, Jonathan. I was just going to say, so um, just with tying it into the things that we're going to carry on, Kathy, you said you used Fourscore. Mm -hmm. April wrote in about programs like MuseScore or Finale That's and great. other things. Are there other programs or platforms in terms of apps that you find beneficial that instead of Fourscore? Or, and someone also wrote in about like, if not using Zoom, what other things have we tried just to alter alternate options? I think other um, options and apps that I know a lot of my teachers at um, university have been using include apps that are activities to do with the students online. So it's not only about reviewing and rehearsing and knowing how to practice their, their repertoire pieces, but guiding them through rhythm activities and ear training and composition activities, which I think is what April Barton is referring to when she's using Finale. She's actually helping her student with some composition, I believe. Um, it, it doesn't have to be limited to just advancing their repertoire, but there are ways to share games and activities with them that are useful. Right. I have What about, I know one of the sides. Hmm? No, please go ahead, Kathy. I was just gonna say, I, I tend to lean towards Fourscore because it's worked for everything I need so far. So I think I'm limited in that regard. Sure. One of the questions that was asked before, and, and I, I, I can't recall who it was because it's scrolled up. Um, going back to some of the benefits that you've been able to, to uh, recognize, Um, what do you to teach? Yeah, it's my internet connection. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what about the, the challenges in dynamics? You know, if, if you're teaching someone in your studio um, on your piano, they have the opportunity to benefit from an instrument that's, that, that is superior. Mm -hmm. But if they're practicing at home on, say, a keyboard, Mm -hmm. or an instrument that doesn't have a wide range of dynamics because maybe it's 100 years old and it's too bright. Mm -hmm. um, I, obviously, that's a challenge, but having now insight into the instrument that your student is practicing on, yeah. have you realized any benefits to now tailor your way of teaching not only to help them in their technique, but also share that with the parents? Yes, and I think it goes back to this idea of comparison, which I use by numbers in certain ways, because what I learn is while my range might be much broader of what I can get for color and sound, there's even a, a weak instrument or a, a keyboard that has limited sound. It does have some options. And what I've learned is that I need to discover those options. And what do those ranges sound like to me if we are playing together on the computer? Um, it makes me know that I need to challenge them. If I say, that's, I think that's not quite soft enough. I know we're on computer, but I think it's not, I'm right. It, it wasn't soft enough. They were able to get softer. And I think we have to start trusting our teacher ears. I think we have to believe that it doesn't matter that we were on the computer. If you think their range wasn't enough sound, um, continue to explore with them in some kind of an exercise that's meaningful to that person what the range of their instrument is. Well, and that, that piggybacks on what we were saying a while ago, the, the, the uh, coloration that they are used to maybe in their uh, house, we can now, having inter intervened and <laughs> imposed ourselves into their practice uh, space, uh, we can make them more accountable. And I think this is, this is great. It's not ideal, would never be as ideal as the in-person lesson, but, we can still challenge uh, the kids to make more tone color and nuance uh, for, for us in this context than they might have on their own at home. Because we don't want them to have a high point of a lesson and then uh, 
reverse back into uh, a level of mediocrity that then we have to just climb out of the next lesson. Very good. Now, what I'd like to do um, is, is, is address that question that Leonard had asked before. Um, we're, we're, we're not going to be in this forever. You know, it's going to extend. Um, it's unpredictable. But there is going to be a time where whatever we recognize as normalcy returns. Um, where do we go from here, I guess, is a question. You know, have, is, is this something that um, your families and your students have asked you to continue beyond the pandemic? Um, are you trying to set yourself up with your families so that they know that once this is over, we have to return to, to in-person. Um, and also, what about opportunities that, that may exist with students who go out of town for the summer to another home where they couldn't ordinarily take lessons, but now all of a sudden there's an opportunity to. So can you speak to where you think we're going with yeah. this newfound technology into the future? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I know Stephen has some ideas too. Um, I personally think that I'll never um, be really interested until technology changes drastically more where both my student and I in every setting were to have the right technology to truly mimic live interaction. And I don't think there's technology that does that uh, well enough for the levels that we're all trying to teach. Um, I would um, not teach full time online. However, I am now newly open to the ideas of sometimes doing this. And in my personal um, teaching life, the most logical time for that is summer. My students tend to go all over to go visit grandma and grandpa or wherever they're going. Or if they're college students, they're going home somewhere and still want to be able to check in sometimes on how they're practicing over the summer and how they're learning. Um, this is very viable, this option. I love it. And um, I feel that my future would include um, some combination of mostly in person. Um, my big reservation is simply, I don't think yet I've learned how to fully refine a student. Let's say I have a student who needs to get ready for an audition for something, an achievement audition, a college audition, a competition, something like that. I don't think we have um, enough technology to truly um, emulate live, but it's closer. I, yeah. This pandemic 10 years ago, we would have been sunk. <laughs> yeah, right. I have taught several students at their vacation homes in the past couple of months, and that's really a, a, a great uh, asset, as Kathy said. Uh, I have had not one, I, and I hope that's a compliment to people like Kathy and me, that, that not one family or student that says we want to stay with Zoom. Because there is everything, at least in my community of students, there is an understanding uh, that there is no replacement for the in-studio in uh, uh, lesson. However, uh, as I said at the top of the program, it is, it is a great and viable option that we will have in the future, for, not only for illness, but, but for, for various other reasons. So I can see it uh, very, very much a combination. And I think that uh, those who are wanting to remain viable as teachers, uh, like I, I was uh, pushed into it uh, <laughs> uh, reluctantly and maybe involuntarily, but I am, I'm I'm uh, uh, committed to what it will look like—a combination of, of in student in uh, in studio teaching and Zoom, especially as Kathy says, as the technology continues to improve. I think we can't be naive about it or um, too reluctant. And I'm certainly a very traditional piano teacher in many ways. Um, but if we're too reluctant, we will right. lose income. Yeah. Never mind the success in helping our students progress. Got it. Well, excellent. Thank you very much. You know, we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. We've got about 15 minutes left. So at this point, Jonathan, um, would you be able to ask uh, maybe another one of the yeah. pre-submitted questions or field questions. some of the questions that we've already had? Yeah, so there's a lot of questions coming through. Some I, I have to scroll and find because you guys are all writing in. So thank you. We will do our best to get to them. But a couple of that um, Gail Arbetter wrote in. One was, I have not been able to share music during Zoom. I've been using a small laptop 
have to have an iPad for that. Is that the only way, Kathy, that you're sharing music is I with the iPad? the whole question I but I think you said that um, she was mentioning that she only shares by iPad is that I think you were breaking up Jonathan so can you repeat that oh, question sorry she wrote I have she I have not been able to share music during zoom I got it I have been using a small laptop do I need to have an iPad for that um, in my experience and understanding yes I think um, you have to be able to, when you click on that share screen, well, let me, let me qualify that. When I click on my share screen button, it gives me four options that include desktop one, which is usually the one you're um, using, whiteboard, iPhone or iPad by AirPlay or cable and iTunes. So it could be, um, to Gail who is asking, it could be that you might want to mess with that screen play button and see if you happen to have any other device that could do it. Hopefully that helps guide Gail. Yeah. Um, she also wrote- if not in, Gail, let us know. <laughs> yeah, please <laughs> let us know so we can try to help. Um, she also wrote in, when my students play very softly, I cannot hear anything. Is there <laughs> any way to adjust this? We, we identify. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, it's hard to know if the reason for playing too softly is the proximity of the device to the piano. Right. That can be explored. Um, there are other devices I didn't bring up earlier that are pretty inexpensive that can be added to iPhones, such as this tiny little Shure microphone. It doesn't cost very much and you can you know, find it online. Um, it may be that some families are able to buy something like that to enhance the sound. Um, it could be that that's the perfect opportunity. I assume you're probably talking about a pretty young child who's probably pretty small if their sound is very softly. It's a new opportunity for us as teachers to figure out some things about sound development for them. Are they using their body enough? Now we can see it in a different way if they are. Are they using their full arm to create tone? That's, that's where my mind would immediately go if it's too soft. Any other questions, Jonathan? One that Mike Dawson wrote in kind of at the start of this, um, he wrote, and you, I'm not sure if either of Kathy or Stephen will be familiar with this or not, but he wrote, can you expand on New England conserve technology and how that might be different from what freelance educators may or may not be using? You broke up a bit. Can you repeat? Okay. So sorry. He wrote, can you expand on New England conserve technology and how that might be different from what freelance educators may, may or may not be using? He's Nothing not. still? No, okay. only I, my daughter would know that if she knows I, I that. I heard you though. I think, okay. um, I'm not sure that the universities have anything more enhanced. I think Stephen's daughter is pretty high tech. I think she has had some capabilities for knowing how to expand and some, there's some really brilliant comments happening um, on the side along here. Some of you have more technological understanding of how to connect microphones well, how to use some other platforms that will enhance the right. sound. Right. Those things do exist, and um, I think perhaps you all can consider having another session that shows deeper use of technology. There are some more complex options. Um, so I have a feeling Stephen's daughter is using um, some options in that way that um, I think are available to a freelance teacher, but it does take some real study. There's a learning curve for me, for sure, and I know for many of us, there's a learning curve, but the options right. do exist. I know Chris, Chris, Christina Long had just, Jonathan, were you going to ask that? Yep. She just wrote in about the, the mic that you had shown, mm -hmm. Kathy, the Sure uh -huh. mic. Uh -huh. And she, um, she wrote, what Kathy showed is Sure mic because someone asked what the mic was. And I bought one lately as well. However, I personally find that it does no difference during Zoom or FaceTime, only for recording. Can Kathy answer to that? Yes. <laughs> I actually agree with you. I have tested it on a few students and asked, do you hear that it's that much different? And their report is no. And so it only helps if I'm recording something for them and back to them. I wondered though, if it might enhance sound when the teacher was talking about the softest child. Um, perhaps there's something like that that could um, pull up the volume a bit. But I think Christina's right. My experience has been it doesn't change it dramatically, at least insofar as my students are reporting when I try to use it. For recording, yes. But in live setting, I think that's the, one of the challenges for us. 
So yeah, there's some great comments on the side. You all have some. Really good I know I'm trying to get through them all. I know one thing that I, um, one person asked a while ago, directing at Steven, can anyone join your master classes? How do they sign up for those? <laughs> those are for those are for currently studying students and that's that's all for years I've done that and that's an augmentation of private uh, lessons so no unless you want to become a regular student uh, <laughs> but that's part of my commitment to my students uh, we have alternating master classes on, on alternating Thursdays in addition to private lessons and for me that halfway point in the group experience has long promoted critical listening commenting i ask them for verbal comments so that that's the to me the 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 ideal uh uh way station uh between a private lesson say and a recital and i believe in the master class experience yeah it's a I know Kathy does a lot of that too oh yeah it's a cornerstone of our prep um program right. at smu is the opportunity for the teacher to hear what the student's actually doing you know what sticks and it's a safe zone between the lesson and the real performance in those right. things it's a real master right. class um actually ours are a little more of a performance class with comments <laughs> there's not always time to dig in deep for everybody it just no. on this right. situation um they're critical and in this time of pandemic i have not had them and i offered them to my whole college studio i said we can meet together on our usual fridays at two o'clock and none of them wanted to play in that setting in part because nobody felt that they had good mics or good pianos that were gonna really demonstrate their work well. And they all instead chose to um, every week turn in personal videos. And it felt like a performance to them in a way to have to make that video. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Cassie McDonald wrote in, is anyone using WebEx for teaching lessons? Are either of you familiar with WebEx? Familiar and not using it. I have heard good things about that too. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, any of these questions that that um, you pose, remember, I just want to remind for anybody who wasn't here before, we're going to review all these questions, and uh, hopefully, if there's enough substance to it, we'll be able to use it as a as a topic for discussion for future platforms. And also, before you leave, um, I'm pretty confident that at the end of this webinar, there is going to be a kind of a survey or a questionnaire that goes out to everyone. Please, if, if you wouldn't mind, your, your feedback will help us to continue to do this. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to, to fill out that questionnaire, that survey, get it back to us with any questions, you know, did you not, did you not like my hair, I, whatever you want to say, you know, feel free to let us know. But I, I do have one, one question as well before we start to wrap up. Um, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a two part question, but I'm going to ask the first part first, um, yeah, Kathy and Steve, this new method of teaching, do, do you, would you say that this makes your job easier, harder, or no difference? Harder in a, in a heartbeat. As Kathy said a while ago, it's a new, a completely new normal. Uh, it, it's, re, it's surprisingly rewarding in some ways, as I mentioned earlier, but it, it's, it's a tougher assignment. It is. And, and then, um, please go ahead, Kathy. Well, I think one of the things for me that's really difficult is that um, in my studio, we tend to be very goal oriented between, you know, what are they learning a piece for? Is it for a perfect, a certain event or is the music for something they're learning personally and um, hope to achieve a performance level of the piece? Um, that component for the moment is gone. And I'm actually sitting on a panel of an international piano competition later this summer. And I'm really curious to see how that's gonna go. There are so many variables for the students who are entering any such events. Um, the piano they're on, the room they're in, the mic they're using, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I find for me right now, um, I hope I'll continue to learn ways to work around this, but um, my students have gravitated to more Rather than fully refining I mean, a piece, they're wanting to learn and get through the earlier stages of more repertoire. For example, I had a student who's supposed to be playing with the Plano Symphony, several students um, and teachers who are here know of that event. And um, at first there was talk that they were going to go ahead and um, figure out some way to have the student, I'm sorry, it wasn't Plano, it was Fort Worth Symphony, do the final round online and finally, they canceled it and realized, wait a minute, this isn't going to be an even playing field. We no, need to no, not at all. The whole event. 
Right. They figured that out. But I find that's been um, challenging and also simply the energy that's used. Yeah. Um, it just feels different. Well, let me ask right. you this then. Um, that being the case, since I, I think we can all agree that this, is, this makes your job more challenging and, and, and more difficult. Um, I want to ask a question from an economic standpoint. Because I, you know, thinking thinking this as a, as a business, everyone's educators, and we all know. And unfortunately, um, it's it's much harder. You know, I, I live by the philosophy that when you're good at something, you make it look easy. You know, <laughs> um, and that being the case, since this is harder, have have you? And this is a, a question that I'm going to ask you, but I guess I'm going to ask the panel too. Understanding now, it's more work for you, and you're having to now sharpen your skills. To, to meet the demands. Has that changed your approach to, to your price list for personally, lessons? Yeah, personally, no, because the way I made an adjustment was gradually I realized that if they paid for an hour a week, I actually online gave them 45 to 50 minutes, um, okay. knowing that I had to utilize that time and energy for them away from our um, actual online meeting. That was one adjustment I made. Um, my studio and probably many people that I know, their studio price lists are an annual adjustment. And so here's hoping that this doesn't go on, you know, that we would actually have to really incorporate it into another entire year. I think the fall is a reasonable expectation that some amount, if not complete online teaching may be happening. But sure. um, so my personal answer is um, no, except adjusting the online time. No, and from a philosophical point of view, as, as a musician, I, I, I'm painfully aware of the trade-offs of online teaching, uh, so, but uh, I have not one family or student uh, that has ever come close to voicing the idea that, are we, are we getting as much from you as we used to? Because they're, they're just, it, you know, it, it compensates, and uh, no, nobody is uh, asking either up or down, and the way the future looks, I don't know, but uh, I would say that that this is uh, since this is a brand new experience for us, uh, we're going to continue to try to make it um, all it can be. As you know, for all these our wonderful attendees, for everybody, I'm reminded of the late Janet Baker Mezzo, who said, "Musicians are the sensors of the human experience," and we have been confronted with a new normal and something a challenge as never before. We have to pursue. And we have, to, we have to continue the great value and sensitization of music in any way, in any uh, uh, challenge that's presented to us. I think that's our great noble goal right now. Amen. Well, Jonathan, unless there are any other questions. I think um, we have two more questions that are quickly showing up so I can quickly get to them before we all leave. One comes from Hannah Payne. She wrote, anyone else experiencing eye strain or headaches? Yes. <laughs> yes. Voice strain. Yeah. No, I do. And um, Hannah, I think some people have looked into the option of buying those, um, what they call those blue lenses. I haven't done it yet, but I'm thinking of getting them because I think the summer will be long. Um, and then I have to reposition my music stand where my computer is. I have to do that quite a lot. And I have to build in more breaks in between the students than is usual. I know in your own studio, you have the student coming one right after the other. You may have to just cushion it a bit. I had way more headaches the first week I did this than I normally would have. So I, I know what you mean, Hannah. And then the other one that um, I could quickly find in all of the messaging that everyone's sending, which I love. That's right. um, Christina Long wrote, and we addressed some of this, but she wrote about how she, uh, students were sending her videos prior to a lesson and that was working out. But the question is during the lesson time when there's a delay and maybe distortion, how are you trying to adapt with that? How might you be able to help guide Christina and better? I'll have a quick answer, and I know Stephen may have one too. Christina, when I've um, been wanting to work at that level with a student, which is often, um, there are a couple things I do. If the distortion is pretty severe, I actually re-log into their lesson. We just log out and log back in. That right. can sometimes help. Um, if it continues, I ask them, please ask everybody in the house to turn off their Wi-Fi for the next 30 minutes. The families typically will comply. Um, if there's a lot of distortion and disruption of the flow, I simply don't try to work on those things because you're right. It's just, we can't, 
it's frustrating and it frustrates the student. Those are the two ideas I've had so far that have helped. Right, and, and mine would parallel it. The, the lack of immediacy in the world that we once knew and, the, and, and then the distortion. You just have to work around it and I'm finding I need to perhaps be content with a little less accomplishment in a lesson where we have technical difficulties. But, you know, you have to push forward. And, and value what you can do. Well, Kathy, Stephen, you know, I, I want to thank you again. I'm, 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 we are all grateful and humbled at the same time for your experience and your willingness to, to help. We want to thank all of our, our, our audience for joining in as well. This brings us to an hour. Again, I think a question here. Oh, I'm sorry, can everybody hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? No, we okay. I, I kind of no, just said can. thank you to everybody. Um, yeah. But Casey, can you confirm that a questionnaire or survey goes out to everyone yeah, who is in attendance? Yep, there'll be a survey whenever you close your Zoom screen. Uh, there'll be a survey. Uh, if you just could take a couple minutes to fill it out. Um, we really do appreciate as we want to continue doing these and, and make them even better. Um, and, you know, I, I don't have nearly the talent as Kathy or Stephen do. Um, but I will say the one thing that I've found for each teacher and student to have a better experience of um, learning and teaching online is if they have a Steinway or Steinway design piano. It just seems to be clearer. There's a lot less glitches and everything like that. So um, we appreciate everything that the teachers do for us. And, and thank you, Kathy and Stephen and Jonathan Gordon for, set, uh, for taking us through this. And uh, we really appreciate it. And thanks to you three as well. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. If every, and I just wrote it again in the chat. If anyone, along with the questionnaire, please fill that out for us. But you can also email us, dallas at steinwaypianos.com. More questions. If I didn't get to yours, I apologize. Lots of stuff was coming through. So hopefully everyone learned a lot. But we want to do our best to answer all your questions that maybe you didn't want to ask or maybe it got overlooked. So just email us. Put it in the questionnaire after you log out of here so we can best get those because we want to help everyone. And stay tuned for the next installment. But until then, have a wonderful weekend and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Thank everyone. You. everybody.